What's up guys, this is Michael from Cartoon Universe and really quick, I got to go to these this amazing, amazing show uh, with Rebecca Sugar. If you're not aware, the Steve Universe soundtrack listening event that was in the Grove in Los Angeles. It was super, super cool, really insightful. Rebecca Sugar was there. She talked about the soundtrack and the meaning of the certain songs and uh, how she came up with them and the writing process. And there was some lore stuff there too. So maybe some theorizing coming in the future based on some stuff that she said. Um, but yeah, really cool events. Uh, it was like an hour or two hours long. Uh, actually, Akeem Lawson was there, so if you're not subscribed to his channel, he makes awesome cartoon and Steven Universe stuff, so go check him out. We'll leave a uh, link to his channel at the end of the video. This isn't the entire thing. Um, I unfortunately was not able to get the whole thing because my phone ran out of memory. <laughs> so there's little pieces here and there that are missing, but this is most of it. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it and hope you get something out of it. And that's it. Okay. Okay, bye. Crystal gems will always save the day. And if you think we can, we'll always find a way. That's why the people of this world believe in Garnet Amethyst and Brown Steven. We love you, Rebecca. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I, I was telling you before, uh, and I was telling these lovely people, that I've had uh, the shortened version of the song, that put the theme song, stuck in my head for days now, months even, and it's not leaving anytime soon. Uh, are you going to turn yourself into the WHO for creating such an infectious uh, viral <laughs> earworm, or do I have to do it for you? Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about that song in particular, uh, because I think writing a catchy theme song is uh, a difficult task. What was the process like when you were first making it? Mm, oh my gosh, well, um, I think I was excited to, I've written a bunch of songs for Adventure Time, and when I was working on this, I was like, I want to use all my favorite go-to chords and do everything, everything I like, just smush it all together into 20 seconds worth of all my favorite things about writing songs. Um, I, I spent a lot of it, I wrote a lot of it in the car, just singing it over and over again in, in the car, trying to figure out what it should be. And I really wanted all the characters to be a part of it, like uh, all of the names inside of it, and for it to just have this feeling that it was really bright and, and happy, but there's something underneath it too. Awesome. How many how many versions of the song would you say you went through when you were first uh, first writing it? Oh, the theme song? Yeah. I, I think it was, it was just the one, I just kept sort of working on it and working gotcha. on it. Gotcha. Like, it's perfect! <laughs> Almost. <laughs> I chipped away at it until it was what I wanted it to be. Awesome. Awesome. And it's so cool that now uh, not you don't just have to watch the show or get to watch the show to hear the songs. You can hear them in album form because it's coming out this Friday. And by the way, I see a lot of you with your phones out there. That's great. Take photos, take videos, use the hashtag Steven Universe Soundtrack uh, and share with your friends. Show them what they're missing out on because FOMO <laughs> is a powerful thing. Um, so tell me about the album. I, I remember reading a, a profile of you in the LA Times where you said that an album was something that you'd really want to do. How did this first come about? How did you guys decide to sort of be like, you know what, we must make this album? <laughs> well, I mean, at this point we were, we had like, like 30, I mean, by the time we were 20 songs, 30 songs deep, we had a whole musical episode. I was like, oh, I just, I want these all in one place. And I want a chance to touch them again because we worked on them and worked on them for the show, but we got a chance with the album to remix and remaster everything, like me and my composers, which is something we really wanted to do because we always want a little more time to make things a little more perfect. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Now, for those who don't know, tell me a little bit about your musical background, how you first got involved in songwriting. Like, when, when did you first uh, uh, pick up a guitar or ukulele and, and try to put words to the music? Um, I actually used to play like Hammer Dulcimer. Ooh. Like, no, Hammer Dulcimer. <laughs> Where are my Dulcimer fans at? Yeah. There you are. That was my first instrument. I switched to ukulele because Hammer Dulcimer, is, I was 10, and it was very big and heavy. It's like this big trapezoid instrument that also no one has in their house, so if you want to bring it anywhere, you, I would have this thing that was about the size of me, and I'd be trying to carry it around. I was lucky when we'd go to like the, the Renaissance Festival, because that's the only place where people would have a Hammer Dulcimer. So I was like this 10-year-old, and I'd go up and be like, oh, can I play that? And they'd be like, oh, this is cute. Like, she's gonna yeah, she thinks she can yeah, Dulcimer. And then I would like sit down and just bust out, because <laughs> I totally I, like, knew how to play it. Yeah. Yeah, not too many people going ham on the dulcimer these days. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I can do it anymore. Yeah, it's been it, a long time. It's like, uh, it's like playing a bike. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things I obviously I love the music of Steven Universe, but I also love uh, the fandom around it because it feels like such a nice welcoming community. Obviously, these amazing people are here watching at home. Uh, you know, since starting the show, what's been one of the most surprising or like I guess rewarding things of uh, talking to fans and like seeing their response to this show? I mean, oh, it's been overwhelming because I was such a fan of cartoons and like past the point where it was like I was young and it was cute like you know I was like a teen and I was still really into cartoons um, and they were like my whole world I'd be like right right everybody and they'd be like ah uh. <laughs> like they weren't there with we me. like CSI yeah, so, like, <laughs> so um so yeah when I see really uh intense fans of cartoons I'm like I, I totally get it and um to see that for something that that I got to work on and make super moving because um, cartoons meant so much to me and the fact that this show means a lot uh, to people, a lot to me in this uh, dizzying, infinite mirror sort of <laughs> way. It's, just, it's, it's very overwhelming. Awesome. Um, yeah, I was also a, uh, a big fan of cartoons well past the age of where I should probably have been talking about them, but hey, who cares? Nerds rule the world now. You can talk about cartoons all the time and get paid for it. It can be your life. It can be your career. You can make them. You can talk about them. Do whatever you want. Watch what you want. Steven Universe, real good. <laughs> um, what's, a, what's a cartoon that you watched when you were younger that uh, was maybe impactful on you or influential that you wish maybe more people knew about? Oh, gosh. Well, I loved One Piece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I just, I just worry it's too short. There aren't enough episodes. <laughs> so, are you going for the same number of episodes of Steven Universe as there are One Piece? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry about throwing you under that bus just now. <laughs> um, yeah, I love ten, um, mm -hmm. and I love Graham. Um, yeah, I just love. Awesome. Well, bringing it back around a little bit to the reason we're here tonight, we are here, this is a listening party with Rebecca Sugar here to talk about the music on the soundtrack, some choice sele selections. Uh, you mentioned sort of getting the chance to go back and remaster and remix some of these songs. What song were you most excited to uh, tackle again? Oh my gosh, well actually, one thing that I just love is um, my composers got to record new guitar for Dear Old Dad, which is a song that I love. It was written by Helen Jones. Um, so that is, it's completely transformed. It's, I, I love how it sounds on the album. It's really, it's probably the most transformed. Um, yeah, and then also, um, what's the use of feeling blue? They, they mastered Ooh. very delicately. And in, in, the, you know, in the show, you can hear you know, her, her booming footsteps and all of that. Like Those sound effects are not there. It's just music now, which is what it should be. Yeah, you have to provide your own booming footsteps. Maybe talk yeah. to your upstairs neighbor. They'll provide. <laughs> Um, who's your favorite uh, cast member to write songs for? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's an, that's And they're all here, and they are listening, and they will take it personally. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I love writing songs for Estelle because we we always get a chance to talk um, before I write the song. She's been she's so great, and uh, she, we'll swap uh, like references, and, and I'll tell her what the song's going to be about, and she'll give me a bunch of advice and. Um, that's just, it's always so exciting because she's, every time I write a, a new song for herself, she introduces me to music I've never heard before and it becomes, like, it changes the way I write music. That's amazing. Yeah, I was going to say, I imagine it would be a little daunting to write music for, <laughs> like, a pop star like Estelle. Yes, it's very daunting. <laughs> But clear, clearly you're up to the task as evidenced by some of the awesome tunes we're going to talk about tonight. Um, were there any songs that you maybe wanted to include in this soundtrack but couldn't fit on uh, this volume one? I mean, this has uh, this has everything we were hoping could be on it. I mean, it's 37, right? 37 yeah. songs? Um, I think it's missing a few, uh, like uh, the little butler theme is not on it. But Aww. I'll find some other ways to get that to all of you, I promise. <laughs> um, uh, well, let's move on because uh, let's move on to the actual listening portion of this listening party where we're going to sort of listen to some of the songs remastered in their new form and also talk to Rebecca a little bit about what we have uh, coming down the pipe. Uh, so the first one we have is Be Wherever You Are. 
So uh, let's let's play that video and uh, let's take a listen. I don't know. If you're having a bad day, put that on. You'll feel better. It seems like in the in Island Adventure, it's like the perfect song for sort of mending fences, mending wounds, sort of like realizing you have to put your own stuff aside. But tell me about that song when you were creating it. What was sort of the impetus behind it? How did it come to be? Um, oh, I wrote it so there was this weekend. It was actually the weekend that like, the show premiered. Um, I was writing that song. Oh, wow. So at Gem Glow, I think just gone online. Um, and I was in a cabin with a bunch of comic artists um, in Big Bear. Uh, and at the time I was, I was writing that song while I was designing Jared Out and Jasper. <laughs> just starting to exist. And, um, and watching people see the show for the, for the first time um, all, all at once. And I was just like feeling so overwhelmed. And the last thing in the world I could do was like appreciate that I was like in this beautiful new place with my friends. <laughs> like all I could do was just like, working and thinking about work and, and seeing what happened to the work. And, and I was just like, and I was trying to write this song too. And, and it started out very different. And then it became this because I was like, I've just got to tell myself to like, chill out. <laughs> um, so I was like, I'm, I'm going to make it about being away and trying to not hold on to all these things even though they're just buzzing in your mind. I, one of the things that this is I'm sort of really one of the things that I love with the album is that you get to hear Zach grow up. So like he, like he almost never sounds the same twice, which I think is so great because I wa I watched him go from like he's shorter than me to being a tough man, <laughs> and it's like his voice like he's, his voice like got deeper and then got higher and then just it's just ev everything like as he's like Stephen is always and it works. I love it in the show because Stephen as a character is always sort of having to reinvent himself and that's part of the show, which is why. Uh, but it, it's all through the music. Yeah, and you, you really hear that on the soundtrack because you're just really focusing in on his voice, which is, uh, unlike the others, changing at a rapid pace. <laughs> yeah, just like the character. Yeah, um, but I'm glad that you learned uh, as well to just let yourself be somewhere different in Big Bear because it is beautiful and you can't work all weekend. Yeah, I did though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we got to benefit from it, so thank you for taking a working vacation. Um, so uh, I have a qu we took some questions online as well leading up to this, and I should say real quick, uh, we are going to do some fan Q&A at the end. We're going to ask that you line up sort of single file. We're going to do about 10 at a time. That way we're safe and everyone gets to ask questions as much as we have time for. So start brainstorming now and think of a real good one. Um, so this one comes from at Ace Trainer Lot on Twitter, and he wants to know, what song do you think gives the best feel of the whole show? I think that's really tough to answer. I mean, it would probably be, it would, it would be Love Like You. It would be Love, it would be love Like You. Yeah, this is the credit song. Why, why, why do you think that? Um, love Like You is really special to me because we, we wrote it actually like as, as it was coming out, we wrote, or we were writing the song and expanding on it in real time. So it was actually written over the course of like three years. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would give the best feel of the show because the show changed over those years, and the song changed over those years, and yet it's still one song. Um, and everything else, any other any other song in the show is like that's like a that's like a where I was at that moment, or where we were at that moment, or how I felt at that moment. But love like you grew and changed, and the meaning of it changed as we wrote it. That's interesting, especially like uh, you know, obviously a song like that you can sort of pick it up and come back to it, but. <laughs> I feel like you are probably coming to it with such a different perspective as the show is sort of crystallizing from just the seed of an idea into what we eventually got to see. Yeah, yeah, it completely changed. Like, like when we were starting, I was sort of like, oh, you know, the lyrics were about. It was kind of like a, it was a secret at the at the start that it was about sort of these aliens that don't really understand how to how to feel sort of human emotion, but then by the end of it, it was like, no, that's, this is a human experience <laughs> of not knowing how, how, to, how to care about other people, but you, but you do, but you want to, you care about them so much that you don't know how to care about yourself, and then if you care about yourself, it makes you able to care about other people, and it's like this balance that's so impossible to find, but then at, at the start, I was like, ah, people don't know this is really about wacky aliens. <laughs> and then by the end, I'm like, oh, I didn't know this wasn't really about wacky aliens. <laughs> Like this is there's definitely something else, and you know I think um, even as I sort of get to explore all the sci-fi fantasy themes, for me the show um, always comes down to uh, it's, it's 
based off my brother Stephen. I have a younger brother Stephen. Um, and so, like, it always comes back to sort of like un unconditional love and knowing that I get to always work on this project about someone that I'll just always love and that has always been so um, supportive of me. I think that song is the same way where it's like, I'm sort of experimenting with it being a sci-fi thing and it's like, no, it, it, it still has to come down to that. Awesome, that's great. Uh, and now that we are several seasons into Steven Universe, how is the show, uh, what's, what's a way that the show has sort of like evolved even from when you first started? Do you approach it differently now? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think I approach it differently always. Um, I always just try to, to be honest, but it's sort of like, honestly the cartoon I want to make at that at that moment and so like as as I change as we change as you know as we work as a as a crew um because I, I the, the crew makes a show I mean I'm there to support the team um you know we're we're growing and changing and the world is changing and so what we want to write about changes too um oh my gosh I forgot the question what did you <laughs> it was a perfect answer I was just asking how the show has evolved since it first started and uh I think you I think you answered it <laughs> tell me this one uh obviously uh Estelle sings it and uh, you mentioned sort of like working with her a little bit what was the process uh like working on uh Stronger Than You with her um well it, I think way early on I um at a record I, I asked her well I was like could I write a song for you, it's very nervous. <laughs> um, and and the, and she was uh, she was down, and, and I was like, um, I wanted I wanted her advice. I was like, if I'm gonna do this, I really want to do it right. So um, I was like, so the scene is coming up. This was you know, I told her everything that was going to happen. And she she knew about Garnet as a character, but I was like, this song's gonna be, um, you know, they Rubens have her reach each other. They've been separated. So and when they reach each other. Um, and they become Garnet again. It's, she already knows she's gonna win this fight, so this has to be a love song and a fight song and a victory song all at the same time. <laughs> so what would that be? Um, <laughs> Good luck. And uh, she started talking about um, uh, Gold by Spando Ballet <laughs> and, and the theme from Fame, and she gave me just these incredible references and she was like, this feeling of this, that would have this drive and, and um, just have like a victorious feeling. Um, and I just all the all of her advice, I just started looping and looping, and um, and I worked on it on the Omni chord, and, I, and then I ended up working with Jeff Liu, who's my writer and storyboarder. Um, he helped me with the beat, and um, let's see, I, I was just trying really hard <laughs> to to, uh, to make it good, and I, and I was just in terms of like the lyrics, there was just so much I wanted to say about um, about that about Garnet. Garnet as a relationship um, that I wanted to do through the song because I thought it was just too uh, it, it, you couldn't she couldn't just talk about it it's it, it's like it's too important to her as a character like um, she'd have to sing and dance about it that's <laughs> <laughs> you know some of us have to do the same thing in our normal lives even if we're not fighting on a gem warship yeah. so I don't blame her um, yeah, that's uh, I, just even taken on its own, just like the, the sort of the chorus of it, it just really pumps you up and makes you feel like you can tackle whatever is ahead for the day. But when you pair it with the visuals and the story, I think it really takes on uh, just this. You, it's hard not to like feel invigorated after listening to that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I love that. Um, I think, well, I got a lot of help from Jeff, but also uh, Ivy and Sarashi, my composer, is there. Um, their, their treatment of that song and also I, I, what they did at the end of it. Like still gives me chills for it because because we sort of had it and my my demo didn't have that ending because my demo was just a song, um, but then it was like it had to combine with all the imagery of, of just like sinking and crashing and um, you know the hope had to have this sort of break in it where it's just like uh, and they the way they burn the strings and oh my gosh I just I'm still so pressed over it they're geniuses complete. Yeah, I can only imagine what it's uh, that feeling of when you're like, well, here's the demo, here's what I'm picturing. Then you hand it off to them. You're like, oh my god, this is this is much different. I love this. Yeah, yeah, they make sense out of my nonsense all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your what's your pro collaborative process like working with uh, Ivan Sarashi? Um, we Skype every week. Um, they're up in San Francisco for for a time. Um, we would Skype late at night because um, Sarashi was in the Netherlands. And we'd be and one one time I was skyping when I was I was actually in 
uh, Korea visiting my animation studios, and we were all in three completely different places. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so, I was like, wow, this is so amazing. And then I like took a picture of the Skype screen like with my phone, and I was like, well, that was stupid. I could have like just screen captured. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, we're, we're all like in completely different places. Um, but yeah, we Skype every week. Um, I talk about the the episodes and and the characters, and we we break down the score for each episode when we have these songs. It's, it becomes more in depth, and um, I'll I'll talk about the sort of the feeling I'm going for, and a lot of times with my with my demos, it's hard to tell because most of them are ukulele. This one was on chord, um, so it had sort of a different vibe to it, and then Jeff had already done all this really cool um, uh, bass and, and drum stuff to it. Um, but like I remember when I, when I was working on Feeling Blue, I asked them way in advance because I, like, that song on ukulele does not sound <laughs> intimidating at all. <laughs> so I was kind of like, I have this, like, like can, uh, can you make this like a lot scarier? Yeah. Um, and like a big feeling? Like a spookalele. Oh, yeah, I was, I was like, I was, yeah, I would never ask uh, Patty LaPone to sing along to one of my ukulele jams. <laughs> I was like, no, we have to, we should, we should. And they just turned it into something incredible. And, and it's pretty rare that I get to work with them on the, on the in the beginning. Um, it's usually we work with the demos, um, and then I get to work with them at the end to kind of flesh it out into something. Um, but for certain songs, they they help me even at the very beginning um, because it sort of I just know I need them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, how do you, uh, I guess, at what point in the process do you decide this is an episode that gets a song? Because one of the things I appreciate is that I love when there's an episode with a song, but I love that it's also not every episode, so you're not just like, you're like, why don't I have one this week? Uh, it's, it feels like a treat when they come along. So how do you, when you're sort of like breaking story on the season or looking at it, is it, at what point do you go, this episode gets one, this episode gets one, I think this one needs one? Um, it, it depends. Um, I mean, we would know always at the sort of premise and, and outline stage. So not, nothing would be drawn yet. We'd be like, this this story you know, is emotional enough for this character that it warrants them singing. Um, and a song has to take a character from, from point A to point B, because if it doesn't, then it'll just be superfluous. It has to be, it has to be that they have to grow in a way that requires them to sing something out of themselves and then change from the start to the finish. Um, sometimes uh, there'll be a song idea that the episode is kind of built around. Like, like I knew for Stronger Than You, like that has to be um, a song because that's the only way to convey the, the kind of, like, the, the fight, victory, love, all at the same time. Like, it has to be a song. It, it couldn't, if it was just a fight, like, what would that be if it was just fighting? It has to be, there has to be this other element to it. Um, and that it was like, it has to be this moment that you've just been waiting for for Garnet. So it was that for me, because it was like, I want to write a Stella song so much. Um, so that sort of becomes part of the episode. Uh, like, Mindful Education was an episode we kind of built around Ooh. a song idea. Um, that actually, that actually, well, that actually started as an episode idea where I was like, can we just have Steven just walk out and, and face like Cam, like face kids and be like, let me lead you in 11 minutes of mindful meditation. <laughs> uh, that would, wouldn't that be really nice to have like as a kid? And then my writers, uh, Ben and Matt, were kind of like, oh, I don't know if that will be like engaging for kids. <laughs> like, yeah. But but they were they were so right. And they were sort of like, we need we need something that we need a story that will make kids who are watching everyone who is watching. We need a story that will make everyone who's watching want mindful meditation to work for the characters. And I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. And then I was like, and, and I had been writing this song for myself because I just wanted something that would help me remember how to do it. And I was like, that could be part of the, it should sort of, that story should wrap around that. So sometimes the song comes first, sometimes the story comes first and requires the song. Awesome. Well, it's so awesome, it's so nice. I, was, I really wanted to write something for Susan to sing. Um, yeah, so I was excited to give them a duet. Yeah, it's, and definitely, it's also an interesting, like, song filled, sort of, seems to feel laden with all sorts of entendres, double, triple, otherwise, especially once you put it together with what's going on on screen, uh, showing off the, the fusion of Pearl and Rose. So what was that, uh, at what point were you sort of, uh, I guess when you were writing the song, what was the intent behind it, apart from just wanting to give a, a duet to these characters? I mean, I was, I, I, the whole episode is exploring their relationship, and I was really interested in exploring their relationship. Um, and it's this is really the first episode where you see a, a side of Rose where that's very imperfect. 
um, and, and the ways that she could be very uh, sort of detached and, and not be aware of people's feelings. And I wanted to sort of show the, the two sides of that, the, the side that, that seems like, um, you know, like mysterious and, and fun, but then it's sort of like, oh, but you, you can't actually have a deep connection with only, with only that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, and it seems like certain characters uh, get certain, there's like sort of leitmotifs at play in that they get certain instrumental progressions or they have certain instruments that are associated with them whenever they have a song. Um, what what instruments uh, do you associate most with uh, with Rose? Oh, strings. Strings are her, are her instrument. Um, that's very, very consistent throughout. And sometimes there will be um, a little, there'll be strings that come in for Stephen and that's sort of that that part of his heritage. Um, you mentioned some awesome guest stars. You mentioned Patti LuPone. Uh, uh, is there a, if in a perfect world, uh, is there someone that you've been like dying to get on the show uh, that you're hoping to down the line? Like who would be like your dream sort of uh, guest star? I mean, Patti LuPone is it was, pretty it was high. Patty yeah, I was gonna say like, <laughs> who, who's like the, the nameless Frenchman that came in second to her Michael Phelps? Uh, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it was, uh, after after Patty LuPone, it's like I don't know what to, I don't know what to do with myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, I have some awesome awesome cast members coming up, so I can't say because I. Um, oh. but, yeah. Ooh, almost, I almost got it, guys. I, I, I tried. I almost had it. I'm so sorry. It's Fred Durst. Um, so let's. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's go. Let's go to a question uh, that we had from uh, for online earlier. Uh, this is from Pang1701 on Instagram, who wants to know what gave you the idea for the off-color gems, and why are they all so lovely and perfect? <laughs> so nice. Oh my gosh. Well, that's many things. Um, uh, well, first off, uh, Ian Jones Cordy, who used to run the show with me, and who's here. Uh, where, where is Ian? Um, uh, He's now working on his show, <laughs> um, OK KO, which is coming out soon. Um, but at the time we were on Steven together, that was like one one of your last things as you were going. It was like you gotta have this uh, these underground gem rebels, and I was like, all right, I promise I'll, I'm gonna make this happen. Because <laughs> um, I was, it was pretty gosh, we were finishing like I think back to the barn at that point. I was like, I promise I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this happen. And then I was also super inspired by. Um, I must have been like a year and a half ago, I went to visit, um, there's an LGBTQ center in Long Beach uh, that I went to visit and I talked to the kids there and it was just so inspiring and they, I was talking to them about things I wanted to do with things that they would want to see and uh, we just had this super, super inspiring discussion and um, it, it was amazing and a lot of what I chatted with them about uh, I ended up incorporated into the off colors. Uh, uh, our, the other, um, I think, Pat Paracha in particular was like a mix of that and also a writing game that we did, where we we will come up with gems sometimes just on the on the fly. And I had already been talking about Pat Paracha um, as sort of a tiny aristocrat, uh, <laughs> uh, and then. There was this other idea of that we came up with that was just like a sapphire with the power to predict the past, and I was like, "Oh, that's it!" It's, it's, and we just we put those two characters together, and, and they became Pad Paraja. Uh, but all of them were sort of long-term dreams that really came into focus as I was working with the crew universe on those episodes. Awesome. Tell me about where did the where did the idea for this song come from? Um, I originally started working on it, trying to write a round, um, and then I recorded it this way because I just recorded it into a mic where stuff wasn't overlapping because I was just singing it through and then they, I, 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 we got sort of um, attached to it sounding like this, which is why it just repeats and repeats and repeats at the end. At the end it was going to be around where it was laying on top of itself, but this just ended up feeling right. I really wanted to write something for Shelby, um, Voice of Voice of Paradox. Uh, just awesome. And she has like incredible rhythm because she's a dancer, so she like really on it with all the timing and um, counting it off, and it actually used to be numbers, and it used to be like one, three, five, seven, because it was like, um, I was sort of using my terrible rudimentary understanding of music, <laughs> uh, it didn't really, uh, I was just like, well, these are like, uh, 
Indeed. They're all seven chords, so maybe this made them in. Anyway, it didn't really make sense. But she doesn't understand music either, so it works out, right? <laughs> um, I think one of those one of those things is actually incorrect. <laughs> I think it's not me, fami, me, fami, me, la. I think it's slightly different. Anyway, obviously that doesn't drive me totally crazy that there's there. <laughs> but I'm, I'm still really happy with it. Yeah. Uh, have you ever considered uh, doing um, the eventual uh, Steven Universe soundtrack, colon, The Remixes, Volume 3, uh, <laughs> including a version of that where it is around? Um, oh, gosh. I don't know if it would work as well as one after all. I could try it again. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Nice. <laughs> that, that was my only question. All right. Thank you. Um, now tell me a little bit about this one, because obviously it's nice to see, uh, it, it's really nice seeing a duet between uh, Stephen and Peridot. What was the challenge there for you, I guess, when you were approaching it? Because obviously, you know, Peridot has to sort of overcome uh, the challenge of not really understanding the efficacy or purpose of music. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I was really excited about um, sort of trying to figure out what, what music would mean to her. Um, and then, of course, in terms of, of a song having to bring a character from point A to point B, this is sort of something that's covering her, kind of relaxing and realizing, I mean, real, realizing what art what art is and sort of what um, what just doing something to enjoy yourself is. I'm realizing that's the theme of, of several of these songs. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Maybe good, it's a problem good that themes I have. are worth repeating. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I just like the thought of sort of breaking that down. It's like, I know she likes... She likes patterns, she likes things that make sense. And this makes sense, it's just not actively solving anything. Um, so I was trying to think about how she would think about solutions without problems. Like what do you do when you create um, a pattern that's enjoyable just because it's a pattern, because it feels like you're being productive. Uh, your brain feels like something productive is happening even though it's just being invented out of thin air. I was like, Peridot would enjoy that. <laughs> That would that would get her there. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it really is sort of encapsulated in the lyric. I think you're insane. I think you're all insane. I guess I am too. Anybody would be insane if they were stuck on Earth with you. Where she's like, you know what? Uh, this is this is crazy, but you guys are all right. Let's. I guess I can deal with this. It's kind of how I feel pretty much every day when I have to just interact with other people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's it's comforting. Um, so I want to uh, shift gears slightly and, and, and ask you a question that we've been getting a lot of. Uh, pretty much everyone and their mother was asking this question online. And uh, the person who we chose to ask you this is totally random 21 on Instagram. Okay. It's totally random. Uh, if Lars is technically the same type of creature as Lion now, will he be able to get home through him shouting really loud and jumping through the portal? <laughs> I mean, that's a, that is a very astute observation about Lion and a, and a thing that he can do, although I will say that a lion's, um, the distance Lion can warp uh, by doing that is not uh, as far as one may think. It's very difficult for him to get to the moon, uh, for example. Uh, that pretty much takes everything out of him. So, um, Kind of like Nightcrawler from X-Men. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a limit on how far yeah. that uh, that particular power can actually move you. He's gonna need something that will get him further. Gotcha. So totally random twenty one, TBD. We had our future songs. Uh, this one comes from oh boy, I apologize if I butcher your name. Uh, Kian or Ryan Randolph. I don't know if that's an R or a K, so you get both. Uh, hello, Miss Rebecca Sugar. Will we see Sardonyx or Blue Diamond sing a song in the future? Well, uh, they're both incredible singers, uh, Lisa Hannigan and Alexia Kadame. Um, I would love, uh, I'm not gonna stop talking. <laughs> I would love to write songs. Um, this one also comes from Facebook from uh, Guillermo Brisseno, and he wants to know who was the first Steven Universe character that was created for the show? Um, who was the, oh, well, I suppose it would be my brother Steven in the year 1990 when he was born. <laughs> Following that early concept art, who came after Steven? <laughs> um, gosh, yeah, I mean, I've been drawing pictures of Steven, like, forever. And uh, um, I think, I guess, after Steven, I mean, oh, it was like Steven, after Steven, there was the 
jams. I was just working on the jams. I think a Amethyst is, oh, Lars and Sadie are older than the show. They're Ooh. actually uh, characters that I used to draw in college. Um, oh. And they, they were part, they were gonna be like a comic strip um, about being these two two kids in college. So they, they predate the show. I suppose that's actually technically the answer. But I, I was also drawing pictures of my brother all the time. Yeah. Around, around the... I get, well, your brother predates. Yeah, my brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Uh, now, I think we have something uh, very special uh, planned, if I'm not mistaken. We've been listening to a lot of pre-recorded songs, and that's all well and good. Uh, but uh, apparently these instruments aren't just props. They're not just for show. Um, uh, that, I can hold the mic, whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> This is, a, this is a question above my pay grade, but I do have working arms. So I can, I can hold one uh, for the vocals and one for the instrument, whatever, whatever you think would be best. I can hold one. <laughs> hey, I got two arms, pal. Please stay comfortably seated in this wonderful stadium seating here at Pacific Theaters. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, well, before we, before we dive into it, uh, why don't we tell people a little bit about this song? Um, I don't know which of the two you want to oh, do first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I could do, um, I'm gonna play something entirely new, which is it's always interesting to play because it's sort of strange to do a duet with myself. But, um, <laughs> but I like to play it because it's got sort of all these different songs hidden in, inside of it. Awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where did we go? What did we do? I think we missed something. Gotta be me. And it wasn't quite me. And it wasn't quite you. I think it was someone driving me. Oh, oh. Well, I just can't stop thinking. So. I would say, um, well, I mean, it's, it's, it sort of depends 
kind of a feeling of redness, but I, what I do is just push through, no matter how painful it is, just just do, just make stuff. Um, even if you sort of don't know, know why you want to make it, or do, like, I feel like once you start, I suppose it's, it's scary, like it's scary if you're talking with nothing to say, like that's what that is, you know, but the art version. So it's sort of like, sometimes maybe you just need to start talking and then listen to the words coming out of your mouth and go, well, I don't, that's not what I mean. And, but only by doing that, you can be like, oh, let me, well, I mean, or quiet introspection, I guess is the other solution. This is a really roundabout. Uh, <laughs> uh, just make, I feel like, I like to sort of, there's a lot of pressure to share everything you make as soon as you make it. And I, and I think it's really beneficial to me to make a lot of stuff that nobody sees so that I can just, I can just see it and look at what I'm doing and just be like, um, like why did I, why did I want to do this? And then once you realize like why you want to do something, you can be like, oh, this is what I'm really excited about. This is what I'm interested in. And then it becomes easy to make art because you want everyone else to be ex as excited about that thing as you are. But the block is when you don't actually know what it is you're excited about. So it's just like pushing through and just making stuff is how you sort of figure out, well, like, I like this, but I didn't like this. And I think also just telling yourself when you feel that I don't like this feeling, that that's not a bad thing. That's like a totally healthy and natural thing. You're basically just like, well, I'm not, I'm not interested in this, but I kind of needed to make this to, or I don't like how this came out, but I need to make this to know that I don't have this skill or I'm not interested in this thing. So yeah, make stuff. Thank you so much. Awesome. So Josiah's friend, uh, thank Josiah, and I hope that answers your question. Uh, all right, over here, what is your name and what is your question? Hi, um, I'm Cam. Um, hey. I wanted to ask you, what gem took you the longest to design because you just wanted to get it just right? They might be. Um, uh, uh, Pearl was a lot of trouble, um, but kind of clicked when when I arrived at the nose. Um, <laughs> there's a long time, like, noseless Pearl, which looks really wrong to me now. Uh, even in the, in the pilot, like, it's so strange. She doesn't have her nose. <laughs> yeah. All right, you over there. What is your name and what is your question? I'm Sonia, and my question is about um, for mindful education with um, Takafumi. When, mm -hmm. when you had that, co how did that collaboration come about? And also, how did the storyboard work out for that? Um, here comes the thought. Um, oh, it was awesome. Well, well, uh, Jeff Liu and Takafumi Hori had been talking a little bit. I knew about his work because he had. Um, he had talked about the show online a little bit, and I love Studio Trigger. Um, so I got a chance to go to I got a chance to go to Japan, and while I was in Japan, we got to visit, um, and so I got to go meet Hori, um, and a, a bunch of other crew members were with me as well, and um, we we a bunch of us at, at, at Trigger and from Cartoon Network like sat down and just were just talking about cartoons and things we wanted to do, and I was like, oh, I really want to collaborate um, on something, and I and we had been thinking about this episode, I was like, I feel like this could be the chance because it's a little, it's abstract and also it's really special. Um, so, and Jeff Liu storyboarded that sequence uh, very roughly and then we, um, and came up with so many of the, of the visual ideas for it. Uh, and then that went to Hori along with, uh, to talk from Hori along with my demo. So he was working with that. And he also did several fight sequences in the episode. Um, and. Um, and we were just talking to each other back and forth. Um, and he also did the, I mean, I could get, how technical do you want me to get about how that was actually made animation-wise? Very technical. Very technical. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, well, Takafumi Hori did the did key animation and also exposure sheets, which were then sent to our studio, Sunmin. And um, they worked off of his sheets and also a separate set of exposure sheets that had the lip sync, because it was lip synced to English. <laughs> Um, and so it was a collaboration between basically everyone who's involved with Steven and its animation. Um, yeah, it was, I'm so lucky that I got to work with Takumi Hori. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, you over there, what is your name and what is your question? Uh, my name is Renate, and um, I have a recommendation since you like One Piece. Uh, if you've ever seen Outlaw Star, Totally recommend it. Oh, you know, I actually do need to watch that. I've seen the very beginning. It's real good. The end is amazing. <laughs> um, my question is, when Jen's views does giving a part of themselves to another soften their personality? Because some of these new episodes you had with the two topazes, it seems like they were very stoic by themselves, but when they were together, it, it more of their personality came out. I mean, it, uh, it completely depends on the gems uh, involved in the fusion. 
you know, what, what that fusion is. Um, you know, Topaz's fusion is Topaz's relationship, um, and that's the nature of their relationship, which is why it's so difficult uh, for her to talk about, because it, it's not supposed to be that way. Um, but I, it, uh, for different, for, uh, for other gems, like, you know, for, for Garnet, her relationship is very different. And, you know, uh, yeah, every, every fusion is, <laughs> is different depending on, depending on the gems involved in their relationship to each other. And I think, yeah, the relationship as a whole, not, not even just who they are, but also how they met and what they mean to each other. So is that why diamonds don't like fusion? Um, diamonds, well, fusion is, <laughs> um, diamonds don't like fusion between different types of gems. Um, the, the diamonds w believe that a fusion is the same, uh, between these same gems would be the same gem but larger. Uh, and it doesn't really take into account the fact that those gems would have a relationship to each other that would mean anything. Um, you know, the rubies fusion is, is completely fine because as far as they're concerned, that's a ruby. Uh, but uh, when different types of gems are combining, it's very, very clear that they have a specific uh, relationship that manifests in a specific way, and that's what uh, is so alarming to them, because it, uh, it's not only that the, those individual gems have individuality, their relationship even has its own individuality. It's like so much that they, that's, it's very, it's, it's not okay with homeworld. Awesome, thank you very much. All right, you over there, what's your name and what's your question? Daniela, and I want to know how does it feel to be an inspiration for others like myself, knowing that you were once there, having like being inspired by other people as well. Um, oh, it's very overwhelming. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's sort of hard to believe. Um, I'm really glad. I'm really honored um, when people say that they're inspired by the show or by me, because I really hope that it would be something that would make people want to draw. Uh, and make stuff, and any time I find out that that's happened, it's, I'm just over the moon, because that was really my hope. Thank awesome. you. Uh, just quick show of hands, who here has uh, been inspired to draw, or drawn fan art, or just done something because they watched Steven Universe? That's awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's so cool. Uh, tweet out your fan art, use hashtag Steven Universe soundtrack, that way, we'll bubble up the top. Yeah, you guys know what to do. Uh, you over there, what's your name and what's your question? Hi, uh, my name's Liesl. And my question is, um, have you ever thought about releasing like a piano book or a ukulele book for all the songs? Uh, there, there is one for some of the early songs um, that has the ukulele chords and also some chord charts on how to play the ukulele um, called Live from Beach City. Uh, that has some of them, although that's it's a little bit uh, older at this point and we would definitely need to do another one with some of the newer songs in it. Um, but yeah, you can check that one out, it's pretty good. I have a quick follow-up to that one because I got this a lot online. Has there been any talk about doing a Steven Universe uh, musical or live show? Oh, I would really love that. Uh, I, would, I would really love that. I would love it as well. Uh, you there, what is your name and what is your question? Uh, hi, I'm Bree, and uh, first of all, my little brother couldn't make it and he would kill me if I didn't tell you hi and thank you for everything. Uh, oh, hi to him. <laughs> Uh, also, my question is about the writing process, in particular world building. So like, with Steven Universe, you managed to create this world that's so complex and full of lore, but also so like simple on the surface, and you don't info dump to world build. So I'm wondering, like, how did you do that? Like, do you know ahead of time what it's all going to be and plot it out, or do you discover the world as you write? Um, yeah, I think, um, like, early on with this show, part of the premise was that, um, you only ever see sort of what's what's within Stephen's perspective, like Stephen's. So as Stephen is growing up, the world is sort of opening up for him, and he's kind of realizing that there's been all this stuff going on that he wasn't aware of, because it's sort of the nature of a of a coming of age story for him. Um, but that also is something I wanted to do with the sci-fi fantasy elements of the show. So we basically sort of built the world, but then only show this small fraction of it because that's what Stephen. Um, is able to see. Um, I'm really interested in the theory of the sublime, which is this idea that um, sort of a beautiful piece of art is frameable 
um, but a sublime piece of art is unframable, which is like you're seeing this fraction of something that's larger um, than what you can actually see. And it's, uh, it's sort of implying, it's beautiful, but it's also scary because it's implying that you aren't really aware of where the actual art is. <laughs> it's somewhere else. And, and I love that notion. And so I thought about that a lot with Stephen. Um, you know, like a, like a human being, he'll never get the full picture. Um, I think that that's just what, what, what life is actually like. Mm. The world building question, because when it comes to Gem Homeworld, you built an entire planet and you gave it like a government and a caste system that seems fairly rigid and all this stuff. I was kind of wondering, is or like there influences from real life things that you drew from, or was this sort of like a hodgepodge of, of different amalgamations of government systems and other cultures that you made up? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, very stylized. Um, I mean, there's, cert there's certainly elements of, um, you know, like classism that's happening within this, within this world. Um, and it, that's, I mean, the whole thing is sort of, it's very stylized, it's very heightened, but it's certainly related to uh, the way that human beings will, will put each other in, in boxes and, and make these snap judgments about each other and, uh, and really do, do horrible things to each other. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's a reality that manifests in all these different ways. Um, and I think, you know, the sort of the show as a whole is very against um, basically any outside force putting anyone into a, a box and saying that's who you are. And so Homeworld is sort of every version of every awful way that someone can um, sort of de basically dehumanize someone because that's what they, they don't even understand what humans are. They literally don't understand. Um, that's, you know, our gems aren't even all the way there. They're figuring it out. That's sort of, that's, it's the nature of gems to not really understand how to, how to humanize anyone. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right, you over there. What is your name and what is your question? Hi, um, my name is Kenneth. Um, uh, rather than a question, I'd like to share uh, something to you. Uh, we met in two, 2015, got a new class. Oh, hi. I asked for advice uh, about uh, you know, like getting into uh, the animation. And uh, you, you shared me that uh, to create and to start drawing comics. And I did, and I, I'd like to, uh, well, I brought yeah. two copies. I'd like to give you one, and to give you one, Besides Steven Universe, are you planning on uh, a new show, or are you starting to create a, a, you know, like something new? Um, right now, I'm, I'm very much in, in Steven mode. <laughs> um, I'd, love to, I'd love to explore the things in the future, but... Um, it's a, it's a very full-time job running Steve. <laughs> Thank you. But you should also check out OKKO OK coming this summer to Cartoon Network. <laughs> All right, you over there. What is your name and what is your question? Hi, uh, my name is Antonio, and I just want to say I'm really excited to be here. And my sister, Erica, we are so excited to finally see you. And my question is um, regarding uh, one of the characters in the show, um, Pearl. What I wanted to know is, um, will we be seeing soon any like of her background, like about her? I want to know like everything. She's my favorite character. <laughs> she is awesome. <laughs> I, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um. <laughs> I, just, I can't. I can't give any spoilers. It's a here. strong maybe. But you make a good point. You really do not know very much about okay. her past at all. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I did want to mention as well as I did meet you in 2014 at um, WonderCon. And oh, cool. Was, yeah, I was so inspired to meet you, and I just want to say I, I love your show. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see you again. Nice to see you too. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, uh, we have time for two more questions. I apologize uh, if you have any others. I will answer them personally later uh, with the same level of authority and uh, clarity you're looking for. Uh, you, sir, what is your name? What is your question? Hi, my name is Mario. Um, we, in, in the beginning of the series, Stephen plans a tape uh, for Stephen, and recently he found Nora's tape. 
Is your third tape where uh, Rose sings a song to Steven? <laughs> <laughs> and what does it reveal like, about Pearl? It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like for Larry or something. Larry. <laughs> it's a third tape. Special song for Larry. <laughs> number three. Uh, no, I, well, that's a, uh, I love the thought of her singing something for him. I don't know if it, I think, um, I don't know if it would be necessarily, she had such a very specific purpose for that, for that tape. Um, I think something like that would have to be treated maybe in a different way. But I like how, you, I like what you're thinking about a lot. <laughs>